Good afternoon. Uh, today we have uh, a very interesting topic in hand, Iran's foreign policy in the post-US withdrawal. Um, Iran is the next door uh, neighbor to Afghanistan. It is a historical, logical, and psychological norm and truth that neighboring countries cannot stay aloof about the situation occurring in the surroundings. And it is imperative to stay in line with the situation in the region as well. The withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan is of immense importance as far as the foreign policy of Iran is concerned. Two decades of war in Afghanistan kept Iran entangled throughout the war session in many ways, specifically in terms of foreign and interior policy. Now the whole world is watching the developments in Afghanistan and Iran is most concerned about what kind of political situation emerges in Afghanistan. And that would be the benchmark of Iran's foreign policy after the U uh, US withdrawal from Afghanistan. To have the topic enlightened, we have an eminent speaker with us today, Dr. Farid Nirbighari. Professor Dr. Farid Nirbighari is a professor of international relations and holds the dialogue chair in Middle Eastern studies at the University of Nicosia. He studied in the UK and received his PhD in international relations from Keele University, England. From 1997 to 2007, he was director of research at the Center for World Dialogue, based in Nicosia. He served as the editor of the Cyprus Review, 1998 to 2005, and the associate editor of Global Dialogue from 1996 to 2008. His writings include International Peacemaking in Cyprus, published by Hearst and Co. and Routledge in 1998, the two, uh, 2010 edition of the Historical Dictionary of Cyprus, and the new edition of the same, co authored by him for fall 2021. His book on war and peace in Islam, a critique of Islamist political discourses, came out by Belgrave in 2012. With this brief introduction, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Abbasi, for that kind instruction, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I shall be very brief uh, about some uh, uh, guidelines uh, or main points on Iran's foreign policy. And uh, if there are any uh, questions, I'll be happy to respond to them. I do apologize if my speech seems a little slur today. There's dental problems I've had, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, my speech is uh, slightly affected. My first point is that uh, generally, uh, in uh, a, a difference between uh, the developed and developing countries, and this is a general point, it does not apply to every case, every country, is that um, uh, domestic policy in, uh, um, in developing countries is at the service of foreign policy, uh, whereas in the developed countries, it is the foreign policy which is there to serve the domestic policy. Um, that is a quite a distinguishing feature between these two. Um, we shall refer to this more in the case of Iran in the course of our discussion. The second point is uh, about the source, means, and ends of foreign policy in developed and developing countries. By developed, I'm, I'm referring by and large Western countries and. Uh, well, uh, the source of uh, policy 
foreign policy is usually the will of the people. Um, sovereignty lies with the people. The means of uh, implementing uh, foreign policy is uh, uh, rational diplomacy, rationality. And the ends is uh, the goal or the, the serving in the national uh, interest or the perceived national interest of the country. Um, <clears throat> uh, whereas in the case, uh, for instance, of Iran, there is, are substantive differences. The uh, source of policy is uh, God, sovereignty lies with God Almighty. And how do we implement uh, uh, foreign policy is by what they call uh, jurisprudence, the Sharia, the way that God has meant for us to operate. And the ends, uh, the goals and objective of foreign policy is to implement the will of God as we understand it, or as the jurist understands it on earth. Well, these are substantive differences uh, uh, in foreign policy. And I think it helps us understand better why this dichotomy and dissonance exists between Iran and uh, the West. I'd like to take the case of JCPOA, which was agreed on 14th of July, 2015. It was an agreement that uh, was to limit and contain Iran's nuclear activities. The agreement came about during the uh, presidency of President Obama. And in the wake of biting sanctions that had been applied on Iran by the UN Security Council, for instance, Iran's export of oil from 1.9 million barrels a day had dropped to under a million barrel a day. These sanctions were biting Iran. And uh, Iran therefore felt uh, the need to come to an agreement. On the side of the five plus one uh, countries, uh, they realized that a nuclear Iran, or they believe a nuclear Iran, will almost inevitably lead to a nuclear Middle East. There is, it is unlikely uh, or a very unrealistic assumption that Saudi Arabia or Turkey will not aspire to become a nuclear power if Iran became nuclear. And of course, uh, none of the big powers really fancied a nuclear Middle East. Uh, now, this agreement uh, lasted uh, only for nearly three years, during which uh, some $150 billion of money um, was given to Iran, Iranian money, of course, but nevertheless allowed, a Iranian government was allowed to have access and use that money. It was seen as a triumph by many. However, uh, on 8th of May, 2018, President Donald Trump abandoned the agreement on the grounds that uh, 
this was very one-sided and he called the agreement embarrassing because the USA had got nothing out of the agreement but had given up a lot. Then he started new sanctions on Iran, but these sanctions were not biting. They were crippling. They were much tougher than the ones that had been applied on Iran before. And they continue to this day. The Iranian economy has suffered as a result. For instance, the currency has plummeted further by another, uh, compared to four years ago, by another 700% Iranian currency has gone down. And these sanctions have affected uh, people and have led to riots and uh, social discontent. So they have been very problematic for Iran. Iranian oil exports really has uh, come down very low. And despite the change of government in the United States, the sanctions are in place uh, with uh, some very few exceptions. For instance, South Korea was allowed to, I think, give the eight or seven or eight billion dollars that it already owed the uh, Iranian government. But by and large, they are in place. <clears throat> now, why is a new agreement seen so important, uh, let's say, for Iran, going back to JC or Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or JCPOA? Well, it is unlikely that, uh, and I think Iran knows that, that it would be able to have the same agreement. The new agreement should uh, include Iranian missile program, which is extensive and uh, has caused concern uh, for certain countries, including Saudi Arabia, Israel, and possibly others. Now, if there is no agreement, Iran refuses to accept the terms, new terms that uh, five plus one wants to include, that would incur, that would carry the risk of an Israeli, a risk, it's not a certainty, the risk of the Israeli military strike on Iranian facilities, because Israel would say, well, there is no agreement with Iran. Iran is refusing to accept it. Iran is continuing enrichment of uranium, a high percentage. It uh, wants to wipe Israel off the map, as it has said officially and unofficially repeatedly. So it will try and it may get uh, a good deal of legitimacy from <clears throat> around the globe in carrying out military strikes against Iran. And of course, depending on what kind of military strikes and how extensive they are, the outcome could vary substantially. If they are deep and very broad, uh, they could have very, uh, again, considerable political implications on the ground, uh, which may not be suitable to the Islamic Republic. However, that would uh, risk a greater regional conflict, Iran unable to uh, defend against Israeli air power may result to its uh, missile capabilities and target other countries that 
have <clears throat> or are in good relations with Israel. Um, there was uh, a meeting, uh, as you probably know, last week between President Biden and Prime Minister Bennett of Israel, the White House, uh, mainly centered on Iran's nuclear program. Uh, as Iran has proven to be rather weak on counterintelligence, I think Iranian intelligence uh, service, I guess it's reasonably is moderately good, but its counterintelligence has proven rather weak because we see a series of attacks, cyber attacks, uh, explosions in very, very sensitive areas of Iranian nuclear program. I mean, we had a year or two ago about 500 kilos of Iranian nuclear documents, hard copies stolen, taken from uh, somewhere near Tehran and taken to Israel. I mean, that was a huge embarrassment for the Iranian government. That there were so confidential those documents that according to one report, only five people in the entire country knew of that, of their location. And in the past year or two, we've had repeated attacks on Natan's nuclear, we've had cyber attacks on Iranian rail network. And, and plenty of others. Uh, so it shows that perhaps Iranian counterintelligence service is not as effective as its intelligence. And therefore, it has been reported that uh, Israel has suggested to the United States that they should not come into a new agreement with Iran. And Israel, in return has promised not to start a military strike against Iran, but continue its um, piecemeal attacks as it has done for the past year or two, taking out uh, key figures like it did a uh, senior or maybe the most senior Iranian nuclear uh, scientist or so a while ago and sabotaging cyber attack explosions and so on without actually starting a major military offensive. Uh, and Biden at the end uh, announced that if obviously there is no agreement with Iran, uh, the US will uh, resort to other means. And what has happened in Afghanistan now has weakened uh, Biden's hand in foreign policy and has made him very vulnerable domestically so far as uh, there are those who are asking for his resignation or impeachment. So he'll be very careful, uh, Biden, uh, with uh, foreign policy and allowing anything else to go through that may be pursued as a defeat in foreign policy. Uh, now, uh, moving uh, to Taliban, uh, Amna, am I doing okay with the time? Uh, am I, I still got time? Yes, yes, you go ahead, sir. Okay. With Taliban, uh, Iran, strangely enough, appeared uh, to reconcile with the Taliban in Afghanistan, despite the fact that some 20, 24 years ago, Iran almost went to war with the Taliban after the Taliban killed Iranian journalists and diplomats. And of course, the Taliban being extreme radical uh, uh, action of uh, in Sunni Islam do not recognize uh, Shia as a legitimate sect uh, in Islam, 
Yet the Iranian Shia government, Iranian radical Shia government, has seems to have come to some sort of agreement with the Taliban for them to come and stay in power. Why? Why should Iran do that in its foreign policy? One, uh, one view is that Iran is looking for all the leverage it can get in the coming negotiations with the West over its nuclear program. And now it has a leverage that it can, it can influence what goes on in Afghanistan. And therefore, uh, being a player as it would like to see itself in Afghanistan gives it a greater leverage in the negotiations. That's one view. Another view is the domestic policy concerns, the number of uh, uh, demonstrations against the government have increased. Uh, and uh, now with the Taliban on the Eastern Front, Iranian uh, people may feel very vulnerable and that they may think to themselves is better to keep the current regime in power because uh, should they be deposed or be toppled, we run the risk of having uh, becoming, uh, if not like Syria, something like Afghanistan, and therefore uh, is better to live with the devil we know than the devil we don't know, so to speak. That could be, that could be some people say, also a concern for Iran to uh, Iran's policy towards the Taliban. The new government in Tehran, uh, President Raisi, uh, he, his cabinet is in one way decidedly different from his predecessor. President Rouhani's government was mainly, if not wholly, formed of intelligence officials, people who were closely associated or even worked for the Ministry of Intelligence. Now, in the current president's cabinet, we see most, if not all, ministers are IRGC oriented. That is uh, very much affiliated or associated to the Revolutionary Guard. For instance, the Minister of the Interior, who himself is actually a Revolutionary Guard. In this regard, I should mention the Ministry of Intelligence and a little background. After the, when was it, 12 years ago, so that would make it 2009, something like that. It, when there were dispute over elections in Iran, um, for, this was the, the elections over uh, the second term of President Ahmadinejad. That's when uh, the IRGC Revolutionary Guard started running its own intelligence setup and network. If uh, not in competition with the Ministry of Intelligence, but at least in parallel to the Ministry of Intelligence. And ever since, they have been operating, both of them, inside Iran. Outside the country, however, I think the Ministry of Intelligence has the upper hand because it has greater network and uh, history, longer history. Uh, so the competition reportedly got so 
actually uh, a competition or rivalry got so intense that uh, they were asked at least not to do intelligence work on one another that they supposedly promised the national supreme national security council because after the 2009 demonstrations which were huge the irgc claimed actually not just the irgc the, i remember reading an interview made by uh, the chief of police the former chief of police at the time 2009 he was the chief of police in Tehran. He is now retired. It was after his retirement that he said in an interview that during those demonstrations, the Ministry of Intelligence was not cooperative at all with the police, which somewhat angered the IRGC, and that's why they began to set up their own intelligence network, which runs to this day. And I should say, they have. Uh, more powerful, more potent weaponry. They definitely now have more money and they are almost not accountable to anyone. They are a government in their own right. Uh, so in that sense, you should say, you could say they are more powerful than the Ministry of Intelligence. Now, uh, the new government in Tehran is unlikely to have any different foreign policy goals than the previous ones. What may change and will probably change is the ways and means to achieve those goals. The former uh, commander of Iranian uh, IRGC external force Soleimani, General Soleimani, uh, according to former minister Zarif, Soleimani believed that uh, the outcome of negotiations will not be decided at the negotiating table, but in the military arena. And if that is the approach that IRGC is going to take, and if the current president agrees with that, then we may see more hard headedness uh, in negotiations and perhaps more concentration on actually what happens on the ground. The priorities for the Islamic Republic of Iran at the moment are foreign policy is not accepting any deal which would, uh, which would limit, uh, do forgive me, <laughs> ignore that uh, telephone if you, uh, if you will. Um, the priorities for uh, um, uh, uh, Iran is not to accept any deal that would uh, limit their nuclear policy in the long run. Um, they would not want to have the same kind of agreement that they did before, which would be subject to a veto by the by next administration in Washington, whoever they may be. Maybe they'll be Republicans, who knows? And therefore, um, they don't want to have the same and they don't want to contain the nuclear policy, largely because of recent history that the experience of former Yugoslavia, experience of Afghanistan 2001 and Iraq 2003, according to one observer, was that if you do not have nuclear power, you do not stand a chance against the United States. Uh, United States can, via military means, bring about a political change on the ground. 
even in former Yugoslavia, without sending even one soldier, just by aerial power, the United States triggered a process that after six months led to the fall of Milosevic. And we see that North Korea that has nuclear power has not been, has not experienced the same fate. The second priority of the Iran, Iranian government is mending relations with Saudi Arabia. That is particularly important because they know if it comes to kind of a military confrontation with Israel, Saudi Arabia will be crucial because the Israelis will want to use the airspace in Saudi Arabia and that will give them a huge advantage. And Iranians want to do what they can to make sure that that does not happen. Prospects for the future, and I finish with this, even an agreement with the five plus one will not provide a long-term relief for the uh, Iranian government, but a lifeline because many of the sanctions that are imposed by the United States are not anything to do with nuclear weapons uh, or I mean nuclear activity. Uh, they are imposed and if they are by Congress and therefore they uh, required Congress to revoke those sanctions. And there is a dispute in the United States exactly can the government and uh, I mean administration in the White House do it or do they need actual approval by the Senate? Uh, it will not be easy to get rid of all the sanctions. And let's not forget, now that for some years, Iranians have not been able to export the oil to their former customers, those former customers have changed their refining requirements to the oil that they have been exporting ever since because every oil requires its own refinement and the technicalities differ, equipments and everything has to be calibrated. It's a time consuming and also costly affair. Will countries easily switch back to the Iranian oil that is spend some money and time again, when now they have gone through a process adjusting their refineries to the oil they are receiving from other countries. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, generally, will any, he, in, in Iran needs lots of investments in every respect. Will companies, be willing to risk uh, punishment or uh, sanctions by the US Treasury. Because let's say, even if they think this is allowed now, would they risk it? Because they think, okay, will I be <clears throat> violating the US sanctions anywhere along the line? Is that possible? Is it a risk they are? Uh, willing to take that if even I am trade, if I trade with Iran, I'm not violating sanctions, but there are some gray areas where I may be, they may say, well, let's just forget the whole thing. Uh, you know, once the US Treasury applied even, uh, I think, $2 billion of uh, fine on Total, the French oil giant. But it will definitely uh, provide a lifeline for the Iranian government if there is an agreement. Now, there is a need for an overhaul of Iran's foreign policy and also domestic policy. If it wants to survive the challenges that it has ahead. On that, 
I finish and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I'm going to open the question answer session. Uh, if the participants have any question, they can use raise hand option at the bottom of the screen or may put their question into the chat box. Uh, taking advantage of the opportunity, I start by initiating my, uh, my own question. Sir, uh, how do you anticipate the ethnic collaboration between Iran and Afghanistan while uh, Iran frames its foreign policy? I, I do not believe that there will be much. I think this will be a short-term affair between Iran and the Taliban because there are ideological, uh, huge ideological gaps. And uh, I, I cannot see any Iranian government, even religious governments as they are being able to side themselves and align themselves with the, with the foreign policy of the Taliban. I think it is a short-term thing, uh, possibly for Iran to use as leverage in the negotiations. I do not think it will last long. Uh, I can see there is a raised hand uh, by Tariq Niaz. Sir, uh, over to you. Sir Tariq. Hello, can you listen to me? Yeah, we can. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, my question is regarding uh, Mr. Bennett, uh, Naftali Bennett's recent visit, Israeli Prime Minister, mm -hmm. to Washington. And there he had been, uh, as it looked to me, was in favor of or was preaching very hard that there should be a, a military strike against Iranian nuclear facilities. And to some extent, I could believe that keeping in view the friendship of Mr. Biden and Mr. Sally Bennett and then Mr. Bennett's own background from IDF, do you feel any chances of uh, such a strike going on uh, in future, uh, in recent, in recent future? against Iranian nuclear facilities, knowing well that Iran, uh, the Israelis, Israelis have got a lot of uh, intelligence uh, information about where those facilities are located and how could they be uh, attacked. And then you also said that Saudi Arabia role will be crucial, that Saudi Arabia, if, if it provides uh, them with that uh, um, uh, facility to, of refueling those aircrafts, Israeli aircrafts, then they can always go. And uh, they may also like to use the UAE also because of their recent uh, warming up relation with that country. So is there any possibility of such strike going in near future? Um, thank you. Well, uh, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. Um, difficult, of course, to answer that with certainty. Uh, well, everybody in Israel knows uh, President Biden is against military strike against Iran the way the Israeli government wanted. Uh, I think even after their meeting, uh, President Biden still has uh, maintained that position. The very fact that to say other options are always on the table, I think Obama used to say that as well. But even then, nobody in Israel believed ever that Obama would agree to military strike against Iran. I think to a lesser degree, but still to a considerable degree. Um, Biden administration is the same. Uh, which means, which means uh, if Israel wants to attack, it would have to do it on its own. And if it wants to do it on its own, that would mean greater risks and greater costs and maybe painful consequences. It is not a road that I think Israelis will choose readily to go without the American go-ahead. However, um, I wouldn't 
uh, sort of discounted. I wouldn't say it can never happen. But the preferred way is to the destruction, piecemeal destruction of Iranian facilities and keeping the sanctions in place, which would mean no agreement. And together with uh, public discontent uh, to bring about a situation that Iran would feel uh, forced to abandon nuclear uh, policy, the program it has, both because uh, the cost is becoming huge, the uh, sabotage, the covert action, and uh, also the uh, terrible economic situation that's driving people into the streets. I think uh, in now, once that process starts, it may lead to some fundamental change in politics in Iran, I don't know. But I believe Israel uh, may now be working on doing that, that basically indicating to the Iranian government that continuing this policy will mean that they may actually lose power because they will have continuous sabotage. And as you said, great intelligence of, that of the Israelis will mean that they can hit Iranian nuclear uh, sites. And uh, with a terrible economy that's getting worse every day, uh, they're risking people's, uh, people coming to the streets and taking matter into their own hands. I know that wasn't a straight yes or no, but I couldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to give a yes or no answer to that question. Um, there is a raise hand by Hamza Tarek. Uh, Hamza, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Hamza Tarek and I'm an intern at Institute of Regional Studies. Uh, sir, my question is that the collapse of Afghan government and the fall of Kabul gate came at the time when Iran was itself going through a political change. Um, Sorry, can you the... can you repeat the questions a bit more slowly because I didn't quite grasp it. If you please, sure, repeat. sir. Thank you. No problem, sir. Sir, I'm what I'm trying to say is that the colla collapse of Afghan government came at a time when Iran was itself going through a political change. So, sir, do you think that Iran would be able to fulfill all its interests when the situation is like that? This is what I'm trying to ask. Uh, well, would the collapse of the government in Afghanistan uh, have a corresponding kind of a domino effect on Iran? Not necessarily. Um, not necessarily. I think. A change um, inside Iran, I mean, if there had been a change in Afghanistan and uh, let's say, for instance, the, uh, the former monarchy had come back to Afghanistan, I would say, uh, yeah, that, would, that, that could have some impact. But we are having um, actually um, a more open government replaced by a radical Islamic uh, government, which call, calls itself uh, Islamic Emirates, that uh, would, I think, uh, somewhat frighten Iranian people into what could possibly happen to them if there is a change um, and kind of force them into submission uh, and also provide, as I said, a leverage for the Iranian government in nuclear negotiations. I don't see a kind of corresponding impact on Iran because of the collapse of the Afghan government. Uh, so there is a question by uh, Brigadier Numer Masood. Uh, 
Iran Afghanistan relation become very tense after the murder of Iranian diplomats under the previous Taliban regime is there any similar Sunni Shia uh, friction evident now is there any sorry what was the last part is there any similar Sunni Shia friction evident now any friction uh not yet not yet but i don't think uh, we are long away from it uh, uh the shias the hazards in in afghanistan are already fleeing and i even heard that some uh, Shia, senior shia clerics in home in iran have uh, voiced serious concern over the iranian policy of siding with the taliban including even now the former president Ahmadinejad, who has openly uh, by through social media has uh, strongly criticized and condemned the policy of uh, siding with the Taliban. So uh, I think there is friction. I don't think this honeymoon is going to last very long. I think soon we will have uh, rupture and uh, problems. I don't think the Taliban will risk fighting the Iranians, um, but Iranians may not mind kind of if it suits their purpose in negotiations with the West uh, to show a uh, force against the Taliban, uh, which I think shouldn't be too difficult uh, for them um, in order to gain advantages. Um, yeah, so uh, friction, yes, I think even though we may not see it now, but there are very uh, credible and uh, very influential religious sources who are heavily criticizing uh, Iran's foreign policy of siding with the Taliban. Great. Uh, sir, uh, the, there is a raised hand uh, by Imran Sardar. Uh, sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Amna, for giving me the floor for a question. And it was really interesting. I, I really enjoyed uh, the in, insights. Uh, I just wanted to know whether uh, there was a real urge or a real change, not was, that is uh, a, a real change in foreign policy approach that seems to be internationalist as of uh, now we can see. So is there a real urge in Iran's foreign policy or it is just for the sake of JCPO negotiations? And secondly, uh, if Iran continue with this uh, internationalist approach, do you see any breakthrough between United States and Iran? Do I see any? Any breakthrough uh, between and Iran. Difficult uh, to start with the last part of the question. I uh, cannot foresee a breakthrough um, uh, between Tehran and Washington in the near uh, or midterm future unless there are fundamental changes on the ground uh, inside Iran. Uh, I don't think Iran has changed its foreign policy. I think uh, if you look at the region, it supports Hezbollah, it supports Hamas, it supports Islamic Jihad, it supports the Houthis, it supports Hashd al-Shaabi in Iraq. Um, and uh, these are the most notable, and of course in Syria, they, it supports the Syrian government. That uh, will not change. Um, in fact, I can refer you to what uh, uh, the Iranian Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei said about four months ago, five months ago, openly, publicly, he said, governments do not decide foreign policy. Governments only execute foreign policy. Foreign policy is decided somewhere else. And he said that uh, as a matter of fact in all the countries in the world, but what he really wanted to say that 
Iranian ministry, foreign ministry, Iranian government does not decide foreign policy. Uh, they are rather uh, the executor of foreign policy. So I do not see any really meaningful change in Iranian foreign policy, unless there are huge changes within the country. Uh, there is a raised hand by Sikandar Ravi. Uh, over to you, Sikandar. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam, for giving the opportunity for asking the question. Uh, my question to uh, the, uh, the scholar SM Farid Sab is to how do you see the emergence of the emergence of Taliban in Afghanistan? As we know that it has been uh, a cause of concern and a diplomatic irritant between Pakistan and Iran relations. Now we are going to see it again. We have seen that Taliban has taken over Kabul and now they are trying to establish their rule inside Afghanistan. Uh, how would Pakistan, as a scholar on this field, how would Pakistan adjust its relations with Iran, keeping in view the context of Taliban factor. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I can uh, I can see that. Uh, of course, you know more about Pakistan than I do, and uh, uh, you know um, uh, Pakistan is also a very complicated uh, structure in decision making, and uh, like Iran. I think its intelligence services have a great say in, in what goes on. And it may be that sometimes uh, the government does not quite agree with the assessment of the intelligence uh, network and, and vice versa. So when we are talking about Pakistan, we should always, or about Iran, we should uh, be a bit uh, uh, more precise which section or which part of the Pakistan or Iran we are talking about. But generally, uh, having said that, um, the number one thing in Taliban is the monumental imperial failure of Washington, United States. I mean, um, they could not have done, discredited themselves any more um, uh, than what they did by this, uh, I, I don't even know what to call this fiasco, this disaster. Uh, why still they did that? Uh, it's still a mystery because it is so bluntly, so clearly, I'm sorry to use the word stupid, that what cannot believe the government of the most powerful country in the world could not foresee this. Iran and Pakistan's relations uh, will not deteriorate. There may be some exchanges, but uh, Iran loves to be in good terms with the Pakistan and the Iranian government, particularly the South, eastern part of Iran, Baluchistan, and there were at times some armed resistance in Baluchistan against the Iranian government. And uh, Iran wants to make sure that if there is armed resistance, there is still a little, they will not be able to escape and take refuge in Pakistan and so on. So it really wants to be in good terms with Pakistan and even though Pakistan is critical, I think Iranians will be, in this case, very tolerant and uh, they will not uh, risk their relations with Pakistan. That is my view. Um, sir, there is a question by a senior research analyst of IRS, uh, Homer Iqbal. Um, her question is, uh, every country talks about bringing peace and stability in Afghanistan, but what role Iran can play in peaceful negotiations? <clears throat> exactly. This is what Iran wanted to be, to be looked at as a player in Afghanistan, so it can use it as a leverage. Iran can, because uh, 
as I said, Pakistans are very, these are very good fighters, but they are not familiar with sophisticated weaponry. Um, I mean, uh, I don't know if the Taliban have any trained pilots, for instance, if they can have an effective air force. So uh, in conventional fighting, Taliban are easily defeatable. They can be defeated in conventional, I'm not talking about unconventional fighting. Um, and Iran uh, can always use that because uh, it has a superior conventional fighting against the Taliban. Um, I don't think Iran will be able to um, use much ideological or uh, religious influence because they are radical Sunnis and Iranians are Shias, radical Shias. But because of uh, Iran, a kind of a power broker, it may be able to send messages back and forth uh, to, to the Taliban saying, well, it's best to compromise now so you stay in power or give some kind of feedback uh, to others about what the Taliban want. That is what Iran, that's where Iran wanted to be. And right now it is there, but I think this situation will not last long because I think uh, it's almost inevitable that friction between the two will come to surface. Um, so there is a question by M. Furkan Han. Um, after the U.S. withdrawal in uh, fall of Kabul, there is a vacuum in the region, and Turkey, China, Iran, and Russia are uh, scheming on how to take advantage of that. Where does all of this put Israel? Uh, Israel, uh, Israel is not in a bad. Place. Israel is in a good position. Uh, do you know there was one report, I don't know if this is a credible report, you might know better, that there is 3,000 3, billions worth of lithium in Afghanistan. Well, I mean, we're talking about three, trip, three trillion dollars. That is so huge that in itself can be a game changer. If it's true, I don't know. These reports, uh, it's very difficult for one to be sure how uh, well-founded they are. China uh, uh, is there, yeah, filling the vacuum. Russia will come. I think uh, Chinese will have better chance in if they want to infiltrate. Uh, Russians don't have a very uh, good history with the Afghanis. Afghanis haven't forgotten that. Uh, Chinese may have, Iran will not have great uh, thing in Afghanistan, as I said, because of this uh, huge gap between the ideologies. Israel, uh, Israel uh, would be good. You see, if uh, Israel has made uh, uh, this Abraham, uh, the recognition by the Emiratis and all the improvements with Morocco, with Bahrain, now it has, I mean, we, we know with Jordan, which is old, with Egypt, which is old, with Saudi Arabia is in the offing. Uh, Israel is in good place. Uh, has Israel got am ambitions for Afghanistan? I doubt it, no. But uh, Israel has now a very, a very radical, uh, Islamic uh, Sunnis in Western Iran, which were traditionally enemy of uh, East of Iran, traditionally enemy of Iran. And I think they will soon again become enemy of Iran. Uh, and that's not a terribly bad thing for the Israelis. And let's not forget to my knowledge, if I'm not wrong, Taliban has never voiced any anti-Israeli sentiments. To my knowledge, I may be wrong, but they are, they have a history of being anti-Iran. And uh, I think that hasn't died. It may have gone into a temporary mode of silence for now, but it will come back to surface, I think, very soon. <laughs> 
So there is another question by uh, Yusra Nain. Um, Iran is frequently mentioned whenever Sunni Shia conflicts are discussed as Saudi Arabia has a 90% population of Sunnis and just um, and just 10% Shia population. And you mentioned that, that the significance of airspace of Saudi Arabia for Iran in case of an is, uh, Iran-Israel military conflict, do you believe that Saudi Arabia will be willing to let Iran use it? And secondly, keeping the deal you mentioned between Afghanistan Taliban and Iran's Shia government in view, will the Taliban government support Iran? Sorry, will Taliban governments what? Will the Taliban government support Iran? Fight Iran. Um, support Iran. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Did they fight Iran? Would they? No, uh, no. Whether they will support Iran. Uh, would they support Iran? Yeah. No, no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. I mean, if... Uh, uh, Iran were to uh, engage in military conflicts, I think Taliban would uh, keep out of it. They would not support Iran. Uh, Saudi Arabia, you see, uh, the geopolitics of the region has changed, is no longer defined by the Arab-Israeli conflict, the geopolitics. It is now more defined by the rivalry with Shia Sunni that we have. And therefore, Saudi, Ar Saudi Arabian uh, foreign policy, the Arabian foreign policy reflects that. They are a lot more worried about Iran now that they are war than Israel. It is the Houthis that uh, fire rockets into Saudi Arabia supported by Iran, uh, not the Israelis. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, as I say in politics. Now, that has brought Israel and uh, Arab countries together because they feel they have one common enemy, and that is Iran. Well, we have a few more questions, but uh, due to shortage of uh, time, I sum up the question answer session. Please. Um, yeah, please, because I will have to leave soon as well. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Farid, uh, for your valuable time and giving us insight into the topic. And thank you so much, uh, um, everyone, for joining us today. Have a wonderful evening. Ah, okay then. Okay. If thank you very, very much indeed for having me. I enjoyed being with you. I enjoyed the questions, and it is great being here. Thank you very much, Ms. Abbasi. Thank, thank, so thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.